Welcome to the Culture Lab. I'm your host, Aga Bayer. This podcast helps you turn your company culture into rocket fuel for meaningful growth. It explores how we can make the word work synonymous with fun, meaning, and belonging. It looks at how we can build remarkable cultures that scale as our businesses grow and the world keeps on changing. Okay, so when you care and challenge at the same time, that's radical candor. Or if you want to call it compassionate candor, you can do that too. Because some sometimes people will storm into a meeting and they'll say, in the spirit of radical candor, and then they'll act like a jerk. And that is not the spirit of radical candor. That is the spirit of the bottom right-hand quadrant, obnoxious aggression. Hey, team. Welcome to episode 97 of the Culture Lab podcast. This episode is brought to you by Culture Brain, a one of a kind global community for leaders and culture champions who want to learn new ways of cultivating remarkable cultures at scale in this brave new world of remote and hybrid work. The Culture Brain community is where we come together to answer some pretty darn hard ungoogleable questions about culture. And our members get to participate in things like weekly huddles, masterclasses, flash mastermind groups, and talks from world-class experts on culture. And you know many of these experts from this podcast. But most importantly, we facilitate deep peer-to-peer connections. Because making work synonymous with fun, meaning, and belonging It's definitely not a task for a single person. It requires tapping into the collective wisdom of bold, kind, and curious culture leaders who are on a mission to redefine and, frankly, decrapify work. So if this sounds like something you'd like to be a part of, check it out at tiny.one forward slash culture brained. And don't worry. You don't have to write it down. There is a link in the show notes. Most people I know struggle with feedback. I think it's simply because it tends to be quite uncomfortable. And so we often choose the easy way out and either avoid it altogether, or when we feel pushed to our limits, we flesh out on people. And personally, I've had many uncomfortable feedback conversations in my career both receiving and giving feedback. But I also had some that were actually quite good. And when I think of the good ones, I recognize that they did come from a place of caring deeply and challenging directly. Something that my guest today, Kim Scott, calls radical candor. Kim is perhaps best known for the concept of radical candor, but recently she also published a new book called Just Work, which talks about how we can recognize, address, and eliminate workplace injustice. If you are not familiar with radical candor, this episode is a great introduction, not just to the concept, but also to its origin story. And it's really fascinating. Plus, you'll get an extra bonus of a really interesting and illuminating chat about recognizing and addressing bias, prejudice, and bullying at work. So with no further ado, here is my brilliant, funny, and entertaining guest, Kim Scott. Hi, I am Kim Scott, and I'm the author of Just Work and Radical Candor. I started a company that helps folks put the ideas and the books into practice. And I, before that, worked at Google, where I led AdSense, YouTube, and DoubleClick sales and operations. After that, I was at Apple, where I designed and taught a class called Managing at Apple. Uh, After that, I... Uh, became a CEO coach to the CEOs of Dropbox, Twitter, Square, and some other companies. Oh my gosh, that's so impressive and so incredibly interesting. I can't wait to dig into your experiences. But before we go there, I ask the same question to all our guests at the very beginning. And it's about those early cultural influences that shaped you as a person. What were they in your case? So very early in my career, right after college, I 
had studied Russian literature, and it wasn't quite clear what to do <laughs> with that. So I moved to Moscow, where I was I was doing a project on military conversion, swords into plowshares. And this was the Soviet Union back then, actually. So I spent a bunch of time uh, in Ukraine working with a tank factory that was starting to make tractors for the newly privatized farm. So as you can imagine, these times have been consuming for me. I've been, my mind has been uh, back there. So that was a big influence. But the other thing that happened in Moscow, I, I wound up starting, <laughs> through <laughs> a variety of strange reasons, starting a diamond cutting factory in Moscow. Uh, wait, wait, wait. You have to pause here. I'm sorry. We cannot just... What? <laughs> so I wound up, uh, after I worked on a project, on this military conversion project, and then the coup happened and the Soviet Union was disbanded and that firm's partner was disbanded. And so that firm left Russia and invested the money in China instead. But I wanted to stay in Moscow. And so through a friend of a friend, I wound up working for a U.S. diamond company called Lazar Kaplan. And they wanted me to figure out what they should be doing in Russia. <laughs> and so... How old were you back then? 23, I think, 22. Oh Very God. young. What a, what a crazy story. <laughs> Yeah, it was. And I sort of was talking to a lot of these, the Russian officials at the Committee for Precious Metals and Stones, which is sort of like their Fort Knox. And they, the Russians had been, I guess the Soviets, I should say, had been stockpiling their large diamonds. They would sell secretly the small diamonds to De Beers. And, and that was a secret because officially the Soviet Union was sanctioning uh, South Africa. Right. But secretly, they were selling a lot of diamonds to De Beers. But they didn't sell the big ones. They were sort of saving the big ones for a rainy day. And I was like, mm. it's raining. It's raining. <laughs> Let's cut those. And so I had to hire a group of Russian diamond cutters. I thought it was going to be easy. I thought, you know, I have dollars, the ruble is sort of worth nothing all of a sudden. And that's what you do to hire people, right? You pay them. That's all there is to it. Nope. Turned out there was more to it. The diamond cutters, they weren't just going to take the job. They wanted to have a picnic. I was like, well, <laughs> all right, I can have a picnic too. <laughs> oh, let me, let me guess. Let me guess, Kim. Vodka was involved. Yes. A whole <laughs> bottle of vodka. You know, and, and in Russia, you have to finish the bottle of oh, vodka yeah. if you open it. So we were pretty drunk by, by the end of the bottle of vodka. And I realized what they wanted, what I could give that their state-owned enterprise could not give, was an assurance that... If things went sideways in their country, I would help them get out and I would help their families get out. What I could do that the state could not do was I could give a damn. All of a sudden, that was like my first insight into management. It's not all about strategy. It's, it's about caring personally about the people who are working for you. That was a big influence. And, you know, I've lost track. I've lost track of those diamond cutters. And I'm sure they oppose the war and or the invasion, I should say. And I hope they're doing okay. Uh, but I've been thinking a lot about them. Wow. I wonder if you can somehow get back in touch, I, thanks to Facebook or whatever. That would be amazing. Yes. I've, I've been trying. I've, been try I've gotten in touch with a bunch of other people who, who I knew who, who were mostly actually in the States already and opposed to the invasion. Anyway, let's let's hope Ukraine can be victorious soon. Yeah, so true and so sad. Oh my God, but this is such a crazy story. Yeah, that's my early cultural influences. I mean, there were others as well, of course. There were some, some mentors I had early in my career. Uh, at one point, I worked at the Federal Communications Commission. So between business, all the most interesting things aren't in the bio. Between business school and joining some startups. I worked at the in, in the federal government at the Federal Communications Commission. 
this is just not this is just nuts i'm so happy that i asked you this question honestly <laughs> because of course the stuff wasn't on your bio no well it's all a long story and people want a short bio and it's embarrassing when people read a long bio but anyway my boss there was reed hunt and he also taught me a lot about what it means to care personally about your employees he was a great boss i mean he was very demanding but he was very conscious of what was going on with people. He wasn't afraid to ask about it. I was in a bad romance at that <laughs> stage of my life. And I'll never forget, we were taking a train from D.C. to New York for some meetings. You know, I was upset. He could tell that I wasn't doing great. And he asked me, you know, what's going on? And I sort of gave him the broad outlines. And then he looked at me and he started, he started <laughs> quoting uh, songs. He said, you know, if it makes you happy, then why the hell are you so sad? I'm like, oh, that is a really good question. And so it was just, it was an example of a boss who went, he, he was more than just professional. He really built a real relationship. And he always had his people in mind. When he was deciding to leave the Federal Communications Commission and, and take his next job, well before he announced to the outside world. He took a risk because we could have like caused trouble and let the cat out of the bag. But he brought us over to his house and he told us what he was going to do and why. He encouraged us to stay, but he, he wanted us to make our own decisions and to have the information we needed to make our own decisions. And so that is another example of a great boss who really cared, who was not afraid to challenge us. I, I worked really hard for him. And also who's very transparent with information. I just saw this funny thing on Twitter where somebody said, this is what it's like in an organization where there's not transparent information sharing. It was a group of blindfolded people trying to pour water in each other's buckets. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Reed was not like that. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. And so now it all makes total sense because... I mean, you became widely known thanks to this elegantly simple concept of radical candor that is basically based on two sort of principles. One is care deeply and the other challenge directly. And it seems like you've worked with people who really held these principles really strongly and really, really believed in them. And it had an impact on you. But I wonder, because, you know, some of these concepts that are so elegantly simple, it's really hard to actually bottle them up or find a framework to capture them. So I wonder, what was that process for you? Because, of course, now you look at your model and you're like, oh, my gosh, it makes total sense. But how did you arrive at that place where you said, this is it, you know, this is what happens and I want to put it out there because it's really going to help people? in those super difficult feedback conversations? So the model is very simple. It's a two by two. So imagine a vertical line, care personally, a horizontal line, challenge directly. And then the upper right-hand quadrant is radical candor. And then I'm going to name what happens in the other quadrants. But first of all, there was just coming up with the names of the, <laughs> of the axes. So the vertical line, care personally, I think I had 600 different phrases there. I just came up with one that was wrong because I think I said care deeply. And it's actually, yes, yeah. yes, yes. People get it wrong. All, I mean, it's the danger of a uh, two phrase. And care deeply would have worked too, frankly. But care personally and then challenge directly also had three or 400 different wow. phrases there. <laughs> and in fact, I was drawing them out it, over the course of really three months. Pretty much all I did was obsess on this model. My husband, who's a, who's a software engineer, said, I could just build you a random word generator. <laughs> what are you doing? It was one of those things. This happens often, has happened often to me in my career, where I'm doing work and I'm enjoying doing the work, but it feels almost self-indulgent or like a waste of time. And often those projects have turned out to be the most valuable. So I just decided that I was going to do it because I really wanted to go deep on this and I really cared about it. It was purely intrinsic. I hadn't sold the book. I didn't know if I ever would sell the book. I had written several other books that never sold. But I just was doing this because I wanted to do it. I wanted to figure this out. <laughs> and so finally, and how did I know that I succeeded? 
I knew that I had failed. An earlier version of the Radical Candor Framework was something I developed when I was teaching this course, Managing at Apple. And that was the vertical axis was smiley face to frowny face. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And the horizontal axis was unclear to clear. And that kind of worked, but the right quadrant was not the upper right-hand quadrant, so that was not quite right. And it somehow left some people with the impression that they were supposed to try to make their people unhappy. So that obviously was was not the goal. And so I got a lot of feedback on that one. And then I had some version of something closer to the current version. And I showed it to Ellen Konar, who was someone who I worked with at Google, one of the smartest people I've ever encountered in my career. And she's very radically candid. She kept saying, no, that's not it. No. (laughs) And then when I finally sent her this current uh, two by two, she's like, oh, this is interesting. I would like to talk to the person who came up with this. So I was like, yes, I'm there. (laughs) So it was that feedback from Ellen Konar that helped. And then there were, what are we going to call the different quadrants? And in an earlier version of the two by two, I called radical candor quadrant tough love. And that, you know, the idea got across, but it wasn't very catchy. Uh, And the tough, I don't know, it just didn't quite work. And then for a long time, I was calling the ruinous empathy quadrant cruel empathy, which I loved. Uh. I loved that. (laughs) My husband kept telling me, no, that's not right. That's not right. And explaining why he was confused. But I really liked it. I was ignoring my husband's <laughs> feedback, which I should never do. I know this by now. And then I gave it to Jack Dorsey to read. And he refused to read it. He's like, I'm not going to read. This looks like a Harlequin romance. I'm not going to read that. And somehow it was like being accused of having written a romance when I was trying to write a book on management. Book. That pushed me to keep thinking about it. And I think I was talking to Gretchen Rubin. And when I said ruinous empathy, she loved it. And then I knew I was on to something. But tough love was the hardest one. And that one I actually changed. I was in an elevator with Dan Pink after we had both given what? a talk. What, what, what do you meet all these people? How do you find yourself in an elevator with Dan Pink? Come on. <laughs> I know. Look, I'm like the Forrest Gump. <laughs> And so I was in an elevator with him after we had both given a talk, and he was he was giving me some feedback on the talk. He's like, it's really interesting. He was building, I think he was building an addition to his house. I'm like, I think about this all the time when I'm working with my contractors. I never quite say it forcefully enough. And then I said, yeah, but tough love isn't quite right. And he was like, yeah, what, have, what else have you been thinking? And I've been like, something about candor, like real candor, tough candor, radical, and I think he said radical candor. I'm like, yes, radical candor. That's it. That gives you a little insight. And it took a long time to come up with that two by two. (laughs) But that's, you know, I really appreciate this story because sometimes, you know, when people see something like that, they're like, oh my gosh, yes, of course. It's so intuitive and so simple and so straightforward. It must have been easy. But actually, these things that look easy, there's a whole journey that typically that people have no idea of. I mean, how many iterations and how many brilliant people helped you with this? That This is incredible. Yes. Yes. I was very lucky. Yeah. And I love radical candor. So I'm so glad that you, that you met Dan in the elevator and that you came <laughs> up with it. So am I. Okay. So can we walk our listeners through the four quadrants and just give them the gist of the model? Because I think Some people might be familiar, but they might want a refresher. For some people who are listening to this, maybe it's the first time that they're getting introduced to the model. And I think it's such an incredibly useful thing to keep in mind. So sure, please walk us through it. Okay. So when you care and challenge at the same time, that's radical candor. Or if you want to call it compassionate candor, you can do that too. Because sometimes people will storm into a meeting and they'll say, in the spirit of radical candor, and then they'll act like a jerk. And that is not the spirit of radical candor. That is the spirit of the bottom right-hand quadrant, obnoxious aggression. And the term obnoxious aggression, I think, works. In an earlier version of the two-by-two, the label there was asshole. 
And I changed that for a really important reason, because I found that when I did that, people would use this two by two to start writing names and boxes. And so I beg <laughs> you, don't use this framework that way. This is not another Myers-Briggs personality type quiz. These are behaviors that we all indulge in every single day. I mean, I know that I, I try hard not to be a jerk, but I'm obnoxiously aggressive at least once or twice a day. There's a lot of problems with obnoxious aggression. One is that it hurts people. That's the big one. But there's also a more subtle problem, which is that when you're a real jerk to someone, they often go into fight or flight mode. And when, they're, when their lizard brain is engaged and their executive function is not engaged, they literally cannot hear you. So you're wasting your breath. And then there's a third sort of more subtle problem with obnoxious aggression, which is most of us don't want to be there, actually. And when we realize we've landed there, it's our instinct not to do what we ought to do and move up on the care personally dimension to get back to radical candor. It's our instinct to go the wrong way on challenge directly. And then you wind up in the worst place of all, manipulative insincerity. This is where you're neither caring nor challenging. And this is where the false apology, the insincere comment, the insincere compliment, the passive aggressive behavior, the political behavior of obnoxious aggression is front stabbing manipulative insincerity is backstabbing. This is where really all the kinds of behaviors that erode trust in the workplace and make it toxic creep in. And the thing about both obnoxious aggression and manipulative insincerity is that that is where the drama creeps in. So if you watch a TV show about the workplace, if you watch The Office or if you watch the HBO show Silicon Valley or anything else, you can see a lot of episodes about manipulative insincerity and obnoxious aggression. But those are not the most common mistakes. By far, the most common mistake that most of us make most of the time is what happens in the upper left-hand quadrant, Yes, ruinous empathy. This is where you care. You remember to show you care. And you're so concerned about not hurting someone's feelings that you fail to tell them something that they would be better off knowing in the long run. When I teach radical candor and in the book, I really focus on ruinous empathy because it's the most common mistake. Because most people are actually pretty kind people who do care, it is really important to move those people over towards radical candor because if we don't, then we're giving obnoxious aggression an advantage in the world. And that's a bad thing. I love that. I think it's really important to think about what we create space for if we don't step into that quadrant of radical candor. Yes. We let the bullies run wild if we don't. Yeah, yeah, totally. So I think it makes total sense to people. No one would argue with that. And yet I know that uh, a lot of people actually stick um, to that ruinous empathy quadrant because it's simply really uncomfortable sometimes. So if people know how to care, but they struggle with challenging directly, what advice do you have? Like, what can people do to challenge directly in a way that is effective and in a way that just doesn't make them freak out? Because I think, you know, what, even when I think about myself and the difficult conversations that I've had, it's nerve wracking sometimes to challenge people directly. How do you do it in a, in a way that is both less stressful for us, but also lends well with the other person? For me, the best thing to do is to tell yourself and maybe tell the people on your team a couple of stories. In my experience, the most common reason why people are reluctant to move over to challenge directly, and therefore it feels safer to them to hang out in ruinous sympathy, is because they really, they want to be nice people. And they want to be kind. And when you remember that it's not kind in the long run to remain silent, that's the biggest thing. And, and the best way I know of to remember that in the moment is to have a story in your mind <laughs> that you can think of. So for me, it's this Bob story that comes to mind that gives me the, the sort of push that I need to challenge directly. Here's what happened. To, it's not really Bob was not actually his name. But I worked with this guy. We'll call him Bob. Can I tell you the story now? Yeah, you totally can. But you know what's going through my mind right now? I'm doing some executive coaching. And sometimes we come up with personas like, you know, the, this 
crazy voice that tells you things. And I tell people, please think of a name of the person who's doing all the talking that you actually go and it's always bob for some reason <laughs> so I'm, I'm freaking out is now. It i don't really? understand that's yes. interesting well i've tapped it's into so a collective subconscious i think so yeah that is funny so here's my bob story bob gives me the push i need to to challenge directly when when i don't really want to which is often i mean i wrote this book because i struggle with this too it's easy to say be radically candid hard to do it so here's the Bob story. I hired Bob. I liked him a lot. He was smart. He was charming. He was funny. He would do stuff like we were at a manager offsite and we were playing one of those endless get to know you games. And this was a startup and we were all super busy and stressed out. And Bob was the guy who had the courage to raise his hand and to say, I can tell everybody's really stressed and would rather get back to work, but it's important to get to know each other. And I've got an idea. It'll help us get to know each other and it'll be really fast. Whatever his idea was, if it was really fast, we, we were down with it. And he said, let's just go around the table and confess what candy our parents used when potty training us. Really weird, but really fast. And then for the next 10 months, every time there was a tense moment in the meeting, because even weirder yet, we all remembered. Bob would whip out just the right piece of candy for the right person at the right moment. <laughs> so Bob was a little quirky, but he brought some levity to the office. Everybody loved Bob. One problem with Bob, he was doing terrible work. He was doing absolutely terrible work. And this was a puzzle to me because he had this great resume, this great history of accomplishments. I couldn't understand what was going on. I learned much later the problem was that Bob was smoking pot in the bathroom three times a day, oh. which maybe explained all that candy, but I didn't know any of that at the time. All I knew was that that Bob was doing terrible work and he would hand stuff into me and there was shame in his eyes. He knew at some level that he was not doing great work. And I would say something to him along the lines of, oh, Bob, this is a great start. This is so awesome. We all love working with you. Maybe you can just make it a little better, which, of course, he never did. So let's pause for a moment here. Why, why did I say something so banal to Bob? I think the issue was that for, there were two issues, really. Part of it was that I truly liked Bob, and I truly didn't want to hurt his feelings. I really did care. I cared personally about him. But if I'm honest with myself, so that was the ruinous empathy part. But if I'm honest with myself, there was something more insidious going on as well, because not only did I care about Bob, I cared about my own reputation as a leader. And Bob was a sensitive guy and much loved on the team. And so I was afraid that if I told Bob in no uncertain terms that his work wasn't nearly good enough, he would get upset. He might even start to cry. And then everyone would think I was a big you know what. And so the part of me that was afraid that he would, he would start to cry and everybody would think badly of me as a leader, that was the manipulative insincerity part. So both of these things were sort of pushing me towards silence. And so I didn't say anything for 10 months. And eventually the inevitable happened. And I realized that if I didn't fire Bob, I was going to lose all my best performers. Because not only had I been unfair to Bob by not telling him when his work wasn't nearly good enough, I'd been unfair to the whole team. And the top performers were frustrated. They, their deliverables were late because Bob's deliverables were late. They couldn't do their best work because they were having to spend a bunch of time redoing Bob's work. And they were going to go someplace where they could do their best work if I didn't fix the problem. It was my job to fix a problem. So I sat down to have a conversation with Bob that I should have started, frankly, 10 months previously. And when I finished explaining to him where things stood, he kind of pushed his chair back from the table. He looked me right in the eye and he said, why didn't you tell me? Yeah. And as that question was going around in my head with no good answer, he went on to say, why didn't anyone tell me? I thought you all cared about me. This is heartbreaking. That's so true. Yeah. And this happens. This experience is the most common management mistake. I mean, maybe you don't do it to someone who's ar as articulate about what you did wrong as Bob was to me, but it happens to people all the time. So 
after he asked me that question, you know, I started like backtracking and Bob was like, I I agree. I should go at this point. My reputation on this team is shot. It's over for me here. And all I could do in that moment is make myself a very solemn promise that I would never make that mistake again. And that's really why I came up with this framework and wrote the book and why I'm talking to you today, because I want your listeners not to make that mistake. And it's such a common one as you were telling the story. I could see myself in your shoes so many times in my life as well. And I realized, so here is an interesting thing that I think you had been more honest with yourself than I have been, because for some reason, what I have seen very clearly is that I simply don't want to feel uncomfortable. Of course. And that's why I'm avoiding it. But actually, you are totally right that very often there is another layer to it. And that's the layer that you have just revealed that actually it's not just about our discomfort, it's also about our reputation and what it's going to do to how we are perceived by our teams, et cetera, et cetera. So it's not just, ooh, you know, I'm such a nice person and I'm just going to feel uncomfortable. I think it's so important to be so honest with yourself. I don't even know, like, how did you, was it clear to you back then that this is what was stopping you from having this conversation or you only see it in hindsight? I think I can articulate it more having written (laughs) Writing a book is excellent therapy. But even then, I think I did, as soon as he said, why didn't you tell me? I knew. Then I I knew, and I knew pretty consciously. You know, I think that I owe my willingness to listen. I mean, in, in a sense, he was giving me feedback is what he was doing, right? And I have believed since I was very young that listening to other people's feedback, even when it's a little bit painful, is important. And, and it was my grandmother, actually, who, t- who taught me that. I can remember vividly being six years old, and she had scolded me for something. I don't even remember what. And I was upset. I was angry with her. And she pulled me aside and she said, look, I told you this because I love you and I don't want you to keep making that mistake. And if you can listen, when people tell you that you're messing up, If you can listen to what they're telling you and decide, you may sometimes disagree with them, but if you can decide if they're giving you good advice, then you'll be so much better off for it. And I was really young and I I can remember I had all my deepest thoughts sitting on my parents' toilet. I can remember sitting on my parents' toilet and thinking about what she had told me and thinking, you know, that's, that's, I agree with her. Great, great. He's right about that one. Yeah. Great lesson. Listen, I can't help but share this. I'm noticing a pattern here, by the way. I really love leaning into the uncomfortable. You really love leaning into the uncomfortable stuff, I think. Because first, for most people, giving and receiving feedback obviously is hard. You wrote a book about it. You really grappled with this thing. And and you've helped so many people, I think, to lean into that discomfort. But now in your new book, you appeal to people to call out bias. And I think that's a whole new level of scary and uncomfortable. Yeah, it's right? way more uncomfortable, yeah. way, way, way more uncomfortable. Yeah, than exactly. in teeth. So first, let's talk about what's in it for us, because I think I want to talk about this new book, but I also want our audience to kind of tune in and really listen carefully to what you have to say about this. So like the people who are about to take what feels like a huge interpersonal risk, right? When you call out bias or address some injustice in the workplace. What are the benefits of of being what you call an upstander and addressing some stereotypes or bias that, that we witness? When you notice something happening, when you notice one person saying to another person, something that is that is biased or prejudiced or when you observe bullying in the workplace and you don't stand up for it, you somehow become complicit. I have noticed this over and over and over again, especially if that person, like if, if I'm, well, if I, I am white and if I notice another white person saying something that's either biased or prejudiced and I don't say anything, now all of a sudden I feel complicit in that. And it's the kind of thing that wakes me up at three in the morning. I mean, for me, a big part of what gives life meaning is trying to become my best person and trying to 
take my ideals and make them realities <laughs> in the world and to live live in accordance with my highest ideals. I mean, I fail all the time and I have to be willing to fail and willing to admit when I fail. Otherwise, I'll never get there. As my son's baseball coach said <laughs> to a kid who wouldn't admit that he hadn't hit the base, you can't do right if you won't admit what you're doing wrong. And a big part of it is we all have this ideal of who we want to become as a person. And if we have a growth mindset about it, that's a, a book by Carol Dweck, which is I, I couldn't recommend highly enough. But if we have a growth mindset about who we want to be as human beings, that means we're not there yet, but we, we can get there. And so if you want to become your best self, you have to become aware of your biases. You have to become aware of your prejudices. You have to become aware of your bullying. Otherwise, you can't stop doing it. And it's one thing to have a growth mindset about a math mistake, you know, oh, I can learn from this mistake, but this is great, you know. It's another thing to have a growth mindset. It's much harder and more important to have a growth mindset about things like biases or even prejudices, because I really have never met anyone who says, I want to continue to make mistakes because I have a bias. <laughs> I don't think anybody wants to do that. Some people are wedded to their prejudices, but they don't see them as prejudices. And I think if we did believe we had a prejudice, most people would want to fix it. And, and those who don't probably aren't listening. So <laughs> I'm going to assume that everybody listening does not want to be prejudiced. I have met more people who will justify their bullying. They'll say, well, I'd rather be a bully than be bullied. And those are not your two choices. <laughs> you don't <Yeah>. have to. <laughs> So usually people don't want to be a bully. And when they realize they have engaged in bullying behavior, they'll stop. Or when they realize that there's consequences for their bullying behavior, at least they'll stop. Yeah, I'm guessing that, well, first of all, a lot of people who listen to this, if not everyone, absolutely agrees with you. And they definitely don't want to be a bully. They don't want to contribute to bullying in the workplace. They don't want to contribute to prejudice, et cetera, et cetera. And yet it's still difficult, right? It's difficult to recognize our own biases. It's difficult to speak up. So I guess we need some good tools to be able to do it well. Because I guess that probably shaming people into enlightenment, as you say in your book, is not, right? It doesn't work. <laughs> not the best strategy, exactly. No. So in your book, you have a lot of interesting suggestions when addressing stereotypes and when addressing prejudice. Would you like to speak to that? Because I found it really interesting and really helpful. Sure. I think the first thing that is helpful is to disentangle bias, prejudice, and bullying. Very often, we conflate them as though they are the same thing. And they're different. They're different problems. And different problems demand different solutions. So I'm going to offer some very quick, <laughs> superficial definitions. There's a lot more to say about each of these topics, but it's useful to have a quick mental snapshot. Bias is not meaning it. It's like a mental hiccup. It's a, it's a brain hiccup. Prejudice, on the other hand, is meaning it. This is a consciously held belief. It's very different from unconscious bias. And bullying is just being mean. So bias, not meaning it. Prejudice, meaning it bullying, being mean. And with that kind of simple, I like simple mental frameworks, as you can tell, it's easier to know how to respond because very often in the moment, you don't know what to say. So here's what to say when you don't know what to say. If you think what you're noticing is bias, you can reply with an I statement. I don't think you meant that the way it sounded. An I statement sort of invites the other person in to understand things the way you do. So, so you're inviting them in. You're not calling them out with bias. With prejudice, however, holding up a mirror in that way is not going to work because the person's going to smile in the mirror and say, yeah, damn straight, you know. <laughs> and so, so what you want to do in the case of, of prejudice is use an it statement. And an it statement can appeal to the law, it can appeal to an HR policy, or it can appeal to common sense. So a colleague of mine, Trier Bryant, was in a hiring meeting, and everyone who had uh, interviewed the candidates agreed that the most qualified candidate was a woman who was Black who had worn her hair out naturally. And the hiring manager said, well, we can't extend her an offer. And Trier said, why not? And the woman said, well, we can't put that hair in front of the business. Whoa. 
what? Which is, I know, it's ridiculous. <laughs> and this was like at one of the most respected companies wow. in this country, a company that prides itself on hiring, you know, having very high hiring standards. It's ridiculous. Anyway, so what would an it statement in that case look like? It is illegal not to hire someone because of their hair, which it was in that state I love uh, it. because of the Crown Act. Or it is an HR violation not to hire someone because of their hair, which it was. Or if the law and the HR policy weren't in place, an it statement could be, it is ridiculous not to hire the most qualified candidate because of their hair. So that is an example of an it statement. Now, if it is bullying, an I statement, which sort of invites somebody in closer, is dangerous, actually. And an it statement is not going to work because when someone is bullying, they're trying to push past boundaries. So if it's bullying, you want a you statement. You can't talk to me like that. Or what's going on with you here? Because sometimes people are not bona fide bullies. They're just in a bad mood that day and they're behaving badly. Or if you feel like that might escalate the situation too much, you can just use a you question to change the subject. Where'd you get that shirt? The point of a you statement is it, you are no longer in the receiving position. Like you're not submitting to the other person. You're, you're in an active stance. And, you know, it's not the world's greatest pushback. Where'd you get that shirt? But the other person is now answering your question. So you're not you're not on your back foot anymore. So those are some simple thoughts. What do you think? I love it. It's really fascinating. And the third piece reminds me of like hostage situations. I remember that one of the tactics that people who negotiate in those situations use is actually asking the person who's taking other people hostage, if they're okay. So like they will ask this question, are you okay, sir? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and often it, it works. It's incredible, like the percentage of success that this question has in those situations. So it makes total sense to me that you would be using the you statement when someone is bullying others. Okay, so I have a question for you about a situation that I faced at work. I think, first of all, if you can identify what it was, and then second, what should I have said in that situation? Shall we play this little Perfect. game? Perfect, let's do okay, it. Okay, awesome. Many years ago, I was working in a large consultancy as a senior consultant, and we went to see a client, a really important client for the firm, with one of our partners. And a partner in a consulting firm is basically one of the co-owners of, of the company, for those people who are not familiar with the industry, so a very senior leader in the organization and he introduces me to the client and I'm representing the part of the consultancy that the client was interested in getting some help from. So I was the most senior person from that team, basically. Mm -hmm. And the way he introduces me is the following. So this is Aga and she's one of the most beautiful girls that we have in the office. Oh, God. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Uh, okay. So we don't know whether it's bias, prejudice, or bullying. So the choices in the moment, the first thing that I would have done in that moment is if, if I had someone on, the, on my team who worked for me, who was a man, I would look at him hard and hopefully he would know that he should speak up as an upstander. There's no shame in asking for help in, in those moments because it's much easier for for the guy who introduced you to hear it from someone else than it is for you. And the other problem, if it was indeed bias, if he was trying to uh, trying to flatter you in <laughs> some way, which he probably thought he was. Yeah, I think so too. Yeah, th then you can use an I statement. And uh, in fact, I had a similar situation where in my very first day of my very first internship, I was 18 years old. You know, I'm in Memphis. I'm standing by the elevator and, and, and I'm working at this bank and an executive at the bank walks up and he says, are you an intern? And I said, yeah. And he said, I didn't know they let us hire pretty girls. <laughs> uh, and it was the same thing. I didn't know what to say, so I didn't say anything. You know, fast forward 30 years. Now I'm writing this book, Just Work, and I'm writing that story and I still can't think of what I should have said. <laughs> Yeah, I'm supposed damn. to know what to say now. <laughs> and, uh, and so I put it out there on social media and I got a lot of funny responses. Oh, did you? Okay. 
my father read it and said, you should have told him to eat shit and die. <laughs> would, would have been the obnoxiously aggressive response. <laughs> but it was kind of instructive to see what, like, what a man might say in that situation. But there's a guy I'm on a board with, and he said to me, I'm really glad you told that story because I realize now that I've done the same thing. And I'm sorry. And he said, here's what you could have done that would have stopped me in my tracks. Here's what you could have said. I don't think that I can work here because I don't think you'll take me seriously if you're calling me pretty girl. And so what's the what's the equivalent of it? And of course, that's what I should have. like as soon as he said that, I was like, of course, that's what I should have said. I like to think of myself as your smartest employee, you know, just make a joke of it. Then he kind of will realize what he did wrong, hopefully, uh, yeah. if he has half a clue. Now, there's a risk when you do that because you may be wrong. It may be prejudice. There's a risk that if you say, I like to think of myself as your smartest employee, he would have said, well, we all know that women are not as smart as men or something and are your most quantitative. And now all of a sudden you're in the realm of prejudice. And that's a risk for you, not because his prejudice can hurt you necessarily, but at least if I were in that situation, it makes me matter. Prejudice makes me far more angry than bias does. Yeah, I think most people probably have the same reaction, right? Yeah, yeah. Obviously, yeah. And particularly when you are in a client meeting, it can be risky for sure. Yeah, yeah. So by the way, if you're the person harmed by a comment, you have the right to remain silent. <laughs> you don't have to speak up. If you're the observer of it, you have an obligation to intervene. So really what should have happened in that situation is one of the other men should have spoken up and said, hey, that's not a cool way to, I'm sure sure Aga has other attributes. That didn't happen. It was so many years ago. And I think really, it wasn't even part of the conversation back then. Just to wrap this one up, I think it was just a stereotype because he didn't do it on purpose, for sure. Yeah, I think yeah. that genuinely his intention was positive and he thought yeah. it was just a nice, <laughs> a nice thing to say and just didn't realize that actually it didn't really sound like that in my ears. Yeah, and probably not in anyone. I mean, he did not earn you credibility by saying exactly. That. So say say that may be very true, but I get my credibility by the fact that I'm the most senior person in this room. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. What do you think? Would you have been able to pull off an I statement after this conversation that we had, and after reading your book? I think I might have because it was a humorous kind of setup uh, in the sense that it was it was light. So I think I could have easily said, I perceive myself as one of the smartest team members or whatever. Absolutely. And I think he would get the message and it would sort of diffuse it. And hopefully he would never say it again in a meeting. Yeah. I wish I had read your book back then, but it's never as late. Yeah. There's a real nuance here because usually I say criticize in private. So if he had made some other kind of mistake, I would say pull him aside after the meeting and talk to him in private. But if we don't disrupt bias in the moment, then we reflect and reinforce it. And so that's really why I recommend that I statement. And then you can talk to him later after the meeting in private about why, the whys and wherefores. But I think it really is important to disrupt bias in the moment. Yeah. So speaking of bias, I think, you know, in many cases, it's so much easier to see prejudice or bias in others. But how can we face our own biases and how can we become a part of the solution rather than unwittingly adding to the problem? For me, it's easiest to actually hire a bias disruptor. When I was writing the book, I I hired a couple of people who read the book and pointed my biases out to me. If you can pull that off, that is really, really, really helpful because it's very hard to know what's happening in our unconscious brains. That's why we need other people to hold up a mirror for us. The other thing that I recommend is if you're a leader, or you don't have to be a leader. If if you're on a team, get the team. It's easier if you're a leader. but, uh, But even if you're not, you can get the team to agree to disrupt bias in the moment. Like I worked with one team and they had a norm. If someone said something biased, someone and a person who observed uh, would say, ouch. And then the person who said the thing would say, oops. (laughs) 
so it's very simple. It's disrupting the bias without disrupting the meeting, right? And then the meeting would keep going. Sometimes, of course, the person would not understand what they did wrong and they would say, oops, but I don't quite get what I did wrong. Can we talk after the meeting? If you want a longer explanation, Trier Bryant and I did a a TED talk about bias disruption. So awesome. check we'll it out. Put a link. We'll put a link in the show notes. Yes. That's fantastic. Thank you. That's so incredibly useful. So I want to move on to the next section of the interview. And Kim, I wish we had more time because this is so incredibly useful, but I want to be respectful of your time. So we have a question from one of our listeners and a member of our Culture Brain community. And it's quite a topical question. So let me play it for you and let's see what you think. Hi, Kim. This is Angela from Toronto. Uh, we've been navigating through tough times now for quite some time. My question is around how do we support team members when their anxiety and stress is high? And specifically, how do we support leaders in this time of complexity and high demand pressures? Uh, what can we do? It's a really important question. And for me and for a lot of other people I've talked to, the stress relief comes from doing good work. Work does not always cause stress, it, it often can be the place where we go and it's a little bit more predictable what's going to happen in our workplace if it's a good workplace. And we know that we're good at our work and that we're getting better at our work. And all of those things are very profoundly comforting. And so my experience is that when you make sure that you take the time to show that you care personally, and in these days when so many people are under so many different forms of stress, and conflicting stress, actually. So you, you, you may be working on a team and some of the people, in fact, the most stressful situation, I was talking to a CEO the other day. He had a team of engineers, software engineers, and half his team were Russian and the other half were Ukrainian. So that's some real tension in the, in the room. And those people were all under incredible stress in different ways. So hopefully the stresses that your team is under might not be that bad, but they're still bad. Some of the people are under stress because during COVID, for example, I was under a lot of stress because my kids were being homeschooled and other people on my team were under a lot of stress because they were single and living alone at home. We're all under stress, but different forms of stress. And in that time, I felt like it was really important for us to take a little bit more time to to do a check-in at the beginning of meetings, to understand what's going on for each other. But it was also really important that we continue to do great work because, because work was a refuge. W work can often, we think of it as this, I don't know why we think of it as something that is not a refuge, but when done well, it is a refuge. It totally is, yeah. So it, that meant that when we were screwing up, we needed to know about it. So for example, Early on in the pandemic, I was having to jump out of meetings early and running down the hill and I uh, had this office in the backyard up a hill and running down the hill to go be with my kids because this or that was happening. And my co-founder, Jason, said, look, I want you to be able to go diagram sentences or whatever it is you're doing with your kids. That's important. But I also need you to respect my time. And I was really glad that he gave me that feedback and we were able to figure out like what are the things we're not going to do so that I'm not I'm not always leaving things half undone. So that was a really important conversation that we had. So radical candor it should de-stress a situation. It shouldn't act, I mean it may cause short term a little bit of short term discomfort, but short term discomfort is much less stressful than long term failure, right? And I think remembering that is really important. And remembering that the reason you're challenging people is because you care about them. Caring and challenging are not in opposition to one another. They're integrated. You're not balancing caring and challenging. You're doing both. You're integrating them. Yes. I have a story to share about how powerful that can be personal caring from one of my team members. And it's a person, it's Anis, and he's been with us for just four months. It was really interesting because one day before he goes on leave, actually, his second leave this summer, we met and worked together. And at some point he said, are you okay? I was like, yeah, of course I'm okay. Why? 
I said, no, I'm, I'm I, seriously, are you, are you doing okay? And I'm like, yeah, sure. What, what do you see that I don't see? It's like, I don't know. It just seems that maybe you are a little bit lower on energy than usual. And then I started getting curious and asking him some questions, what's happening, because I was genuinely not aware of it. Then at some point he said, yeah, you know, so this and this happens. And he said also some tasks that, that you said you would do, they, you know, you didn't do them and it's not like you. And that was so incredibly powerful that I was like, yeah, I haven't, I haven't taken my vacation yet. I am tired and I'm just not admitting it to myself. Right. And I also actually need to start taking care of myself. And so what I did as a result of this literally three minute conversation, well, maybe five minutes, I don't know, was I started running for the first time after 13 years. I'm training now for a marathon. I'm not going to run a marathon, but if I do 10K, I'll be happy. And right. And eating, eating better. And also I'm going to take a few days off. And that all of that wouldn't have happened, I think, if we didn't have that five minute conversation where he really cared personally about me and challenged me so, you know, in, a, in such a subtle way. And that really relieved a lot of my stress as well. I love that story. It's, I mean, it is incredible the impact you can have. In fact, I got, a, I got an email from a reader who said that he had someone on his team who was not, you know, usually a very clear thinker and seemed kind of rambly and things were, you know, just was seem, seeming incoherent. And it was during the pandemic. And he, ha he, you know, for all the reasons that we were just talking about, he was hesitant to, he figured maybe he was just under stress. He didn't want to bring it up. But it finally got so acute, he he's decided he needed to talk to me. And it was the same thing. It's like, are you OK? Because and it turned out this guy was having like a gas leak in his house. He was getting poisoned. What? And he would not oh have discovered gosh. it were it not for this feedback. It literally saved his wow. life. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. What a story. I mean, yeah, really, this is such such a powerful concept and so incredibly important. And thank you, Anis, by the way. I want to give him a shout out on the show for doing that because you know it's not it's a good question and also sometimes it takes guts especially if it's your boss you know and you really want to find out what's going on and why she's not doing the stuff that yeah. she promised she's yeah. doing right <laughs> it's, it's not an easy thing to do and he did it's it not. so skillfully and i don't think that he read your book yet so it was really impressive i have to say that's great yeah a lot of people do this very instinctively it's impressive so let's move to the rapid fire questions i have five questions for you and we will have around two minutes for you to answer them. So the first one is, at Culture Brain, we are on a mission to make work synonymous with fun, meaning, and belonging. What would be your number one tip to strengthen one or all three of these foundations for a healthy culture? Disrupt bias on your team. Do the oops and ouch, or we raise a purple flag. If someone says something biased, we wave purple flags at each other. <laughs> Figure out how to disrupt it in the bias so that bias doesn't disrupt your team dynamic because it is so bad. It's bad for the person who is harmed by the bias. It's bad for everyone who observes it and remains silent. And it's bad for the person who says the bias thing and doesn't want to be that person. And it's bad for your results. People cannot do their best work when they are constantly experiencing bias. So ouch, whoops, and purple flags. I love it. What is the sign or signs in plural that a company culture needs some work or perhaps even a major overhaul? I think one of the signs is when people feel like they can't speak up. They can't say what they really think. And that sounds like not that big of a deal, but it is a huge deal in an environment where you can't say what you really think. You can't possibly do your best work. You can't possibly be your best. You can't possibly feel included. I mean, people read Beautiful Country. <laughs> people will endure great hardship in order to say what they really think. Beautiful Country is one of the most beautiful books I read this year. When I read it, the main thing that I kept thinking of was, wow, this family was really willing to sacrifice in order to be able to say what they really thought. So you can't underestimate the importance. Uh, psychological safety is, is predicated on everybody feeling safe and free to say what they really think. Yeah. Kindly, yeah. not in an asshole <laughs> way. Yeah. Are there any companies that you admire for the culture? And if yes, why? 
There are companies who have done great cultural work. Uh, one of the companies that I really admire is Textio. Textio just launched a product that will help people when they're writing performance reviews. It will it will disrupt the bias. <laughs> the program will disrupt the bias. We'll point it out. We'll make people think more deeply. And it will also create reports for the whole company that show when there is consistent bias in performance reviews at the company. And this is so important because if you don't disrupt bias in the moment, you reflect and reinforce it. And if you don't quantify your bias in your systems, in your performance review systems, in your promotion systems, if you don't quantify your bias there, you will wind up with unconscious discrimination. And I think, you know, 10 years ago, general counsels were saying, ah, let's not quantify the bias. If we don't know about it, we won't get punished. That is no longer true. Ignorance is no excuse. You are held accountable for your quote unquote unconscious discrimination. Textio, right? Textio, yes. Check it out. They just we'll launched this product yesterday and I am thrilled about it. Awesome, awesome. And we'll put Payscale is another company that is really working on quantifying bias in pay data and identifying it for companies so that they don't indulge in wage discrimination. Awesome. We'll put links in the show notes. Finally, what books on philosophy, culture, leadership, anything really, you would like to recommend because you feel like they would be useful and helpful to our listeners? I mostly read books on, I read novels. You write novels too, right? Is, is it true? I've written novels. Too. In fact, I've written three unpublished novels and I'm writing my fourth novel right now. Wow. So fourth time's charm. <laughs> But to me, the best way to build empathy for others is to read novels. Uh, so George Eliot, Middle March is worth re I read. That's a novel I read every <laughs> every 10 years. Anna Karenina, I reread every five years. Everything by Toni Morrison. Everything oh Toni Morrison yes. ever wrote. Uh, the, the Bluest Eye, Song of Solomon. These are books I reread uh, every couple of years. I love Toni Morrison. Angela Mayo, just beautiful, beautiful books. There is an important book that I think we should all read right now, which is Hannah Arendt's uh, The Rise of Totalitarianism. It is really uh, eerie right now. This is something we need to fight. We need to fight. There's something like 30% of people have kind of an authoritarian mindset, and 70% uh, have, you know, more of a live and let live philosophy. But the authoritarians fight for their <laughs> for yes. their bullies. And those of us who, who don't like bullying, we try to ignore it. And we as a society cannot afford to keep ignoring bullying. We need to create consequences for bullying. Otherwise, it, it really leads to tyranny. I couldn't agree more. We had uh, Megan Rates on the show um, before you, and she talked about employee activism. I think it's such an important topic. And it, I'm so happy to see more of it because it's, it's an important part of our lives. And if we cannot express ourselves and our views at work around some of these important issues, then when and, and how? So yeah, I wish we had more time and maybe we can, we can meet again and talk about this a little bit more. Absolutely. There's a whole section in the book about creating consequences for bullying in your organization. If you're a leader, please read that. Read that section if you don't have time to read the whole book. Okay, fantastic. Well, we put obviously the link to your book as well in the show notes. But if there are any other places where people should go if they want to learn more about your work, about what you do, what where would you like people to go? What's the best place? Radicalcandor.com and justworktogether.com are there's lots of great resources uh, in, on both websites. And you can follow me at Kimball Scott, K-I-M-B-A-L-L. -L. Amazing. Thank you so much, Kim. That was incredible. I'm so incredibly grateful for you, for your time and for you sharing your wisdom so generously and for your work. Well, thank you. Thank you for, uh, for helping me get the word out there. It means a lot. I'm Aga Bayer the creator and host of the Culture Lab podcast. And this is the Culture Lab team. Anis Enlabarawi, production manager. 
Sound producer, Heather McPherson, Twisted Spur Media. Thank you for joining us for this episode of the Culture Lab podcast. Kim and I hope that you got inspired by what she shared about radical candor and also about addressing injustice in the workplace. If you'd like an opportunity to interact with Kim and with other guests of the Culture Lab podcast, I think you might consider joining the Culture Brain community. Culture Brain is one of a kind global community for culture leaders who look for new ways of cultivating remarkable cultures in this brave new world of remote and hybrid work. If you are in charge of a culture shaping initiative, and if you believe that work should be synonymous with fun, meaning and belonging, you'd probably feel right at home in our community. You can learn more about Culture Brained at tinyurl.com forward slash Culture Brained. You'll find the link in the show notes. And now it's time for the preview of our next episode. And this time I have the pleasure to bring you an award-winning science journalist, Catherine Price. Now, I found out about Catherine's work while I was working on my second book, the thesis of which was that there is no one size fits all when it comes to company culture, because, you know, every company is different. But when I dug deeper into my data, into the hundreds of interviews that I've done with people in many different companies, I discovered, to my horror, that there were some really impossible to ignore common themes among successful companies. The culture was built on three pillars, fun, meaning, and belonging. And while much has already been said and written about meaning and belonging, there was not a lot of research done on fun. But I did find eventually Catherine's book. And to my utter amazement, I realized that we've arrived at almost the same conclusions when it comes to the nature of fun. So here is the preview of our conversation where Catherine talks about her definition of true fun. Enjoy. True fun is the confluence of three factors. Those factors are playfulness, connection, and flow. So very similar to what you were talking about as well. So playfulness doesn't necessarily mean that you have to play games. I think a lot of adults recoil at the idea of playfulness. And also that seems just very frivolous and childlike. So it's not that. It's really having a lighthearted spirit and not caring too much about the outcome of what you're doing. You know, doing things just for the sake of doing them. Not succumbing to our perfectionism because we're such perfectionists as adults. We think we can't do anything unless we're really good at it. And that needs to just, (laughs) we need to let go of that in order to have fun. And then connection is the feeling of having a special shared experience. And one thing that was interesting in my research is that, while I think that it is occasionally possible to have true fun alone, in the vast majority of stories people told me, there was, an, there was another person involved. And that was true for introverts, too. In fact, a lot of people said, because I asked them, is there anything about what you just told me that surprised you? A number of people said things along the lines of, I'm a self-proclaimed introvert, and yet all the stories I told you, because I asked them for three stories, all involved another person. And then flow is the state of being so engaged in what you're doing, actively engaged, not passively. We're we're not talking about like sitting on the couch and getting hypnotized, but actively engaged that you lose track of time. Thanks for tuning in and listening to this episode of the Culture Lab podcast. If you found any moments that were interesting, inspiring, or maybe even game-changing, please share this episode with someone who'd appreciate it. After all, good ideas are meant to be shared. If you haven't subscribed to The Culture Lab yet, you can do it on any podcast streaming platform of your choice. If you want to receive our weekly insights on cultivating a remarkable, powerful, and authentic company culture, especially in a business that scales, type this into your browser, tinyurl.com forward slash agabayer. That's T-I-N-Y-U-R-L dot com forward slash A-G-A-B-A-J-E-R. Also, we would be ever so grateful if you could rate and review our podcast on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to it. And finally, the entire Culture Lab team and our guests, we are going to continue exploring how we can make the word work synonymous with fun, meaning, and belonging. 
and how we can build remarkable cultures that scale as our businesses grow and the world keeps on changing. So, what do you want to hear about next? What matters to you? Email us at lindsay at and let us know.